Thank you very much, Nick. Um, so I'm from Moodle HQ, and so um, you'll know Moodle from the learning platform. Could you just have a quick show of hands if, if you currently use Moodle um, or have done in the past? Just stick your hand up. That's everyone in the room. Thank you very much. Um, Moodle is pretty ubiquitous, like over 100 million users of Moodle worldwide, but I'm not here to talk to you about the learning platform today. Um, I'm here to talk to you about something new, and, and I want to kind of just riff off something that Amber did yesterday. I tried my best to try and represent my career history in the same way that Amber had done, but she must have some kind of advanced slide skills, because I couldn't seem to be able to do it as, as kind of cleanly as she did. So I resorted to a list, and I wanted to just um, situate what I'm doing in terms of my own practice, which has been a theme of this conference. Um, but also just to echo what Amber said yesterday in terms of coming to learning technology, not from computer science or technical background, but instead especially through trying to understand humans in society. So my background is philosophy and history. I was a history teacher. Um, I also trained staff on using technology. I was a senior leader in schools. Um, and then I went to work for JISC, and JISC have a heavy presence here um, at Alt-C. Um, and I worked as a researcher analyst around um, OER, around mobile learning, and around digital literacies, which was the subject of my doctoral thesis. Um, from there, I went to work for the Mozilla Foundation, and you probably know them best through Firefox, the web browser. Um, I worked on Open Badges. I was on the Open Badges team from 2012, um, and I also worked as their web literacy lead. Um, and then since then, I've been a consultant. I set up a co-op with some people who I used to work with at Mozilla, and also Brian Mathers, who you've seen some of his images already. You'll see some more in this presentation. I know he's watching this live stream, so hi, Brian. Um, and also, since the start of this year, four days a week, I'm now leading the project that I want to talk about now, which is MoodleNet. Um, I'm still doing consultancy um, and cooperating as well. I think it's important to do lots of different things because it keeps you fresh. Okay. So the reason I joined Moodle, the reason that um, I decided to um, kind of uh, not do as much consultancy but to join Moodle, was because of Moodle's mission in the world. And Moodle exists to empower educators. As I've already mentioned, um, there's lots and lots of people who use Moodle worldwide, and they're all using Moodle slightly differently in different contexts. And that's one of the wonderful things about what Moodle provides. Just a quick um, explanation of how Moodle makes its money, if you didn't know. Moodle, like um, Catalyst, who's a partner of, of Moodle, Moodle has a, a number, lots of Moodle partners worldwide, and we get 10% of the revenue from their Moodle generating um, products and services, and also we now have um, some shareholders, not venture capitalists, but people who are interested in the long term um, in kind of societal change and um, empowering educators. Just in case you're wondering where Moodle gets its money from, we're not like um, other organizations in that respect. The other thing, just to flag up before we begin, is that just like Alt, Moodle believes in openness. All of the stuff that we do is open source, which means that you can take that and run it for your own purposes without having to um, be told what to do with it. You can use it for your own purposes, and um, we, we don't tell you how to use our products. Um, and the same is, is for Alt, and we believe in working openly and transparently in everything we do, and that's how you can get involved in this project. So if you've got a device in front of you, feel free to go to this link now. This is the canonical URL for the MoodleNet project, moodle.com forward slash MoodleNet. And everything that you need will be linked to from there. And I'll make sure that the link to these slides is on there um, after I've finished talking. So MoodleNet, um, before I get into what it is, I just want to zoom out and kind of situate it within the kind of the wider world, because I think we need to look up from what we're doing in learning technology and think about how it affects our world. If we're trying to empower educators to change our world, well, what are those things that need changing? Uh, you'll be familiar, I'm sure, uh, your university or institution is probably already talking about um, the global goals for sustainable development. And obviously, Moodle wants to contribute towards goal number four around quality education. But I think MoodleNet especially, as I come to tell you a bit more about it, is, is focused on number 11 as well, around sustainable cities and communities. Moodle, the learning platform, has been around for the last 16 years and isn't going any away anytime soon. And the same with MoodleNet. It's going to be around for a long time. So we're not just like trying something out and then going to pull it. This is something which we're in for the long haul because we're trying to build a place where communities can thrive. Now, 
When Martin Duyamas, who's founder and CEO of Moodle, asked me if I'd like to lead this project, there were so many things that he was talking about with MoodleNet, and, and asked Brian to try and capture some of these. Um, you can see some of them here in terms of having like a dashboard with news coming in from trusted sources, um, about having a narrative of professional developments, so you're linking to your portfolio, but like CMOLT, uh, private conversations, public conversations, um, being able to find people in your locality that you can meet up with. Um, it's about supporting other people through crowdsourcing and, and uh, with your own money and OER and all of this kind of stuff. So we have to start somewhere with all of this. We're going to try and build all of it eventually, but we have to start somewhere. And the place that I decided, after lots of research, after talking to people like Amber and researching and talking and doing interviews with people, we decided to start with a resource-centric social network. And I'm going to explain what that means in due course. But it's basically about curating resources and sharing with other people. And as an educator, I feel that's something which is certainly intrinsic to, to my own practice. So if I had to describe it with words, I'd describe it as a, as a social media platform for educators focused on professional development and open content. It's about sharing and learning to improve the content, the quality of education, and it's going to be an integral part of the Moodle ecosystem. But even if you're not using Moodle as a learning platform, you can still use MoodleNet. It's going to be focused on all of the things that you come to expect from Moodle in terms of it being a private space, if you want it to be, um, being ethical and transparent, obviously being open, being safe. It's, it's, we're not going to be doing shady business practices. And also the whole point of it is to connect educators worldwide to build stronger relationships around the world because Moodle is used in every country of the world and in every single language. So before I show you a quick video, an overview of where we've got to with kind of a prototype of Moodle, I want to explain some of the stuff that you're going to see in that video and why it exists. So as an educator, when you go looking for something for your course, you've got an intention. And sometimes you know exactly what it is that you want to search for. You've, you're being proactive in that regard. Um, the trouble is, sometimes you don't always know what it is that you're looking for. And I was at the OE Global Conference earlier this year where some Dutch librarians were doing some experimental work on how you can surface stuff to people who perhaps don't know the terms that they're looking for. Um, I, was, I found this recently when I was trying to find a particular technical thing, and it turns out that it was called a faceted search. But it must have taken me a few days to figure out that that was the search term that I was looking for. Now, when I was doing my research and interviewing people, people said, well, one of the reasons I really like following other professionals in my sector on social networks is because it's like waiting for treasure to arrive. Um, every day I go on there and I find things that I wouldn't necessarily have been looking for, but is absolutely relevant to my practice. So we're trying to build something that can be used both, both proactively, because you know what you're looking for, but also reactively, because people within your network are sharing things that you wouldn't necessarily have looked for. So what would that look like in practice? Well, something like this, where you... Uh, you have things which are surfaced from people that you're following, first of all, then from open education resource repositories, and then from the open web. Um, how this is going to work um, in the light of the EU copyright directive yesterday, we still have to figure out. Um, so feel free to answer me, ask me questions about that later on. I'm going to show you, without further ado, um, some work that we did with um, a co-op called Outlandish in London three months ago. Martin Dugiamas flew over from Australia. It was the first day of work for our technical architect. And we managed to produce, in a week sprint, um, the following video, which gives you a flavor of the kind of thing that we want MoodleNet to look like. There's no code behind this. This is one of those kind of mock-up prototypes, clickable prototypes, that have been tested out by people in the Moodle community, like Jess Gramp and some other people who came there to help us test it out to give some feedback. So here we go. Um, just to say, I'm aware of the number of times I say certain words in this video, and I am thinking about creating a drinking game based on it. Here they are, 
Oh, there was Moonlet. Great. Well, I already know what this is. So I'm going to go there. And since last time, uh, Moonlet has updated its privacy policy. So you leave that intact. Click I agree. And then here we are, the Bolshevik Revolution. Great. Well, you can see this is a collection, a collection of resources. And it says, finally, a good collection of multimedia resources about the Russian Revolution from a worker's perspective. You can see that there's some contributors here. So it's a collection which is being made by, by people. Oh, great. I can add it to my Moodle. So I can add this to my Moodle course. Um, and I, I can also add my own resources collection, it looks like. So let's have a look what's in it. Uh, GCC History of the Russian Revolution. So this is um, a, a website, activehistory.co.uk, that's got some resources, interactive exercises for GCC history. And you can see here that um, some people have commented saying that there's a bit two minutes in which really brings this to life. Great, so there's kind of conversations and, and uh, comments happening from some of my colleagues. What else is in here? Well, let's have a scroll down. Russian Revolution in 10 minutes. Oh, this is a YouTube video. Again, there's other people who are commenting on this. This is great. This is exactly what I want for my teaching. So loads of resources here. Oh, and there's related collections as well, other things that I might find useful. This is fantastic. And this is something which the Red Group has collected. So a community has curated um, this particular collection of resources. So let's find out a bit more about the Red Group. This renegade group of historians have a shared interest in all things relating to the Russian Revolutions of 1917. Well, that sounds like a lot like me. So I'm going to join this community, and I can do that because this isn't one where I have to apply. I can just join and then sign up straight away. So here I am. I'm now a member of the Red Group. I can join in the discussions, and I um, can start helping them curate resources. Excellent. Okay, well, let's see what's going on. I'm going to go to my profile. Here we are. This is me, Jeremy, and I was added to MoodleNet by Andrea LeBlanc last week, my good friend Andrea. And I've started filling out my profile, my, my Twitter ID, and I probably have my LinkedIn profile later on. And you can see I'm now a member of three communities. I'm a history teacher, so um, I'm a member of these three groups. And I've started tag adding tags or interests, things that I'm interested in, so that MoodleNet can suggest things that I might be interested in. That's exactly what I want, so I can make sure I've got good resources and good people I can lean on in my, in my teaching and learning. So now I'm going to go to see what's been happening in the week that I, since I joined the moment. So here's some updates. This is kind of a, a highly personalized feed of things which are useful to me. So I can see that Andrew has now also joined the Red Group. She must have seen that I, I joined it. There's new communities. Uh, people have added resources in there. Red Gems accepted my request to join that Red Group. And my Moodle.net profile is 78% complete, so what I'm going to have to do is to make sure I complete that. Um, I'm going to have a look at communities, I can also search, and here are my communities, a really educator-friendly, focused place where I can find resources and have discussions about my teaching and learning. So this prototype was built this week um, during this design sprint, and I'm really interested, all of us at Moodle are interested in finding out what you think of this. It's just a start of the 10 and we're going to iterate towards it. So tell us what you think, get in touch, um, and if not, the URL for everything to do with MoodleNet is moodle.com forward slash MoodleNet. So that's the kind of um, UX, UI of, of what MoodleNet could look like. It's just our first cut. The idea is that there's um, collections which are curated by communities. That's the, that's the idea behind it. That's the hypothesis that we're testing. Um, now, behind all of that, I want to dig into it because as learning technologists, we need to understand the technology which is underpinning all this. Um, has anyone heard of Mastodon or any kind of decentralized social network? Thank you, a few of you. Um, so Mastodon is a bit like Twitter. So instead of you just signing up to a, a single instance, like on Twitter, there are multiple instances. So for example, I've been a member of one which is all about uh, co-ops. There's other ones about um, art, other ones about um, LGBT rights, all that kind of stuff. So you can see people on your instance and what they're talking about, but also the wider network as well, which means that you can move between them depending on your interests and depending on the kind of people you want to associate with. We're going to build something which is decentralized for MoodleNet, which is the hard option. It is not an easy thing to do, but we think it's the right thing to do because we want to build things which are empowering. We don't want to centralize everything on Moodle HQ. We want it to be like Moodle, the learning platform, where you can have power and control and authority and autonomy over what it is that you're doing, your learning technology. 
this quotation talks about how decentralization is powerful because there's no single centralized authority. Instead, each party or, or peer makes local autonomous decisions and then shares that information with other peers and providers. So um, the advantages of having this, instead of having a single centralized system, um, the advantages of having a decentralized system is that we do get diverse contribution from all around the world who might have different use cases to what we've envisaged. It means that it's more efficient to make local decisions try and, instead of trying to get everything pushed into a centralized product. And it also means that you can keep some things private within your institution without having to share everything with the entire network. So we, we're allowing kind of private spaces. An example of that, which I was talking to someone about earlier, might be that you um, have access to resources as your institution, which you don't have a license to share with the whole network, but you certainly want everybody at your institution to have access to those resources, which you'd be able to do within MoodleNet and then share other resources more publicly. Now, to dig even deeper into some of the technical stuff here, um, Mayel de Borniel, who is our technical architect based in Athens in Greece, um, he couldn't be here today. But if you're interested in some of this on the development wiki, it does di d have a very deep dive into some of the programming languages we're using and some of the, the tech choices. But just to give you a, a flavor of that, we're, if you imagine a spectrum between a fully decentralized um, system where every single peer is equal and a closed software as a service product like, like Twitter, we're somewhere in the middle because what we want to do is to have something which we need to rename. It's an API as a service which basically means we're providing a service to everybody within the network. So you set up your own version of MoodleNet, you're sharing information in your own instance, but also across the entire network. Um, and we're providing services with that API around search, so you can quickly and easily search across the network, so that you can have nomadic identity, so you can move around the network and still be the same person, have the same followers, and also do privacy respecting contact lookup. Uh, Mail's already got a prototype of how you could upload your contacts, your address book, without actually sharing the, the names and addresses and telephone numbers, you're sharing the hashes of them. Um, and then you can kind of check to see if that person exists on the network. Um, I can go into more detail about that in questions or privately afterwards if you're, if you're interested. Just quickly in terms of the technical architecture here, um, just to, to point out that from a user's point of view, they will not see this complexity. They will just see a very simple to use web app. Um, as you've seen some of the prototypes already, um, the web app will be the thing which we release in beta in January to a select use of test, a group of testers. And then we'll be developing a native app to be able to use uh, via app stores. And the back end, all of these things here and all this diagram is available on the development wiki. Um, your organization would take the code, uh, develop it however you want, and so long as you meet certain uh, terms and conditions about code of conduct and also the way in which you have a, a robust code base, um, you'll be able to connect to the API as a service. If some of that went over your head, don't worry, it's not fundamental to understanding what MoodleNet is about. I haven't got time today um, to go through all of the other screencasts that we've done, some of the, the things we're putting out to the community for feedback. Some of them, which we've put out, we've already kind of rejected as an idea. So there's one here around creating an alias, which we've already thought, actually, I don't think that's going to work very well because we've had some feedback from the community. So if you're interested in this, please do have a look at what we're doing and give us feedback. We can only make it as good um, as the feedback we get from you. Um, one thing you might be particularly interested in if you are using Moodle is the sending collection to Moodle prototype that we've just had a look on the screencast here. It shows how you would curate a collection with other people in MoodleNet and then send it into your Moodle course so you can use those resources. Um, I talked at the, the start of this presentation about how Moodle is funded. And one of the things we've been thinking about was how are we going to um, have a sustainable version of MoodleNet here? Um, obviously, we work a lot through our partners, so um, if you want to set up an instance of MoodleNet, initially we'll probably go through partners, but there's lots of things we could do. Some of them range from the sensible, like referrals to Moodle Cloud or Moodle Partners, to the, to the slightly crazy, like equity crowdfunding. Um, or sponsored content, we could do that. I was over at the Mountain Moot in Montana um, earlier this year, and they have Moodle Box, which is like an internal currency. My son's playing Fortnite all the time with V-Bucks. We could do something like that. We could do cryptocurrency, for goodness sake. But more likely are donations, referrals, and membership at different levels. So just to finish off, we're, we've done the research and planning. 
we, we've done the design sprint and specification. We're just kind of doing the prototype and testing at the moment. And we're looking to launch a minimum viable product of MoodleNet in January 2019. And if you'd like to be part of the beta testing for that, do let me know. If you want to contribute, do go to moodle.com forward slash MoodleNet and click on the link to take to ChangeMap. You won't probably have seen ChangeMap before because it's currently in beta with a New Zealand-based organization. If you've ever used an issue tracker before to figure out from a suggestion from the community all the way through to development, it's like that, but it's much more user-friendly for, um, for colleagues who are less technical. So I've got some FAQs which I can go through, but I'm sure that you've got some questions. So before I go through those, I'm going to point you again to moodle.com forward slash moodle.net. Um, you can email me at any time, doug at moodle.com, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so we're going to stick this on the screen. If you have a device in front of you and you'd rather not put up your hand, you're very welcome to enter the ID 1527889279. If you're watching this on the live stream, you can do the same thing. Um, and I'm not looking at my Twitter feed at the moment, but Nick, I don't know if there's any on the Alt-C thing. You're very welcome to do that. But let's go in the room first. Um, does anyone want to stick up their hand and ask any questions? We've got a roaming mic over there. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, there's no stupid questions, just my stupid answers. We have one over here. Um, that looks really fabulous, a really valuable resource. Um, I guess one of my potential concerns, not concern, but something to think about, is how do we ensure that this gains enough momentum? You mm. know, the fact that it's open, it should do that. Mm. But I'm thinking of things like Jorum and other sort of learning resource repositories in the past right. that, you know, haven't sort of continued to evolve and with the community for various reasons. So I think for this a long-term impact, it needs to reach that critical point. And mm. I'd just like to hear what your thoughts are on that. No, absolutely. Um, I was on the steering board for um, Jorum when I was at JISC. And uh, we have experimented with this in the past. If you've ever been to Moodle.net, if you go there now, you can see that you can share entire courses. Now, um, you have to formulate, as a product manager, which is effectively what I am um, in this role, you have to formulate hypotheses um, based on the research that you do and also your own experience. And that one of the hypotheses that I have is that Educators sometimes want to download an entire course and look through what other people have done, but mainly are looking for a resource for a specific part of the course. And so what this will do is will allow educators to curate collections of resources for a specific module or a specific day or event or whatever it is. And some of them might actually be collections of courses or collections of plugins or collections of resources or whatever it is. But the idea that it's a community having a conversation to try and find the best resources for a particular thing. So this isn't trying to just create a massive place. I don't think we've got a problem around not having enough resources in the world. I think we've got a problem around discovery, which is why we spend time thinking about proactive and reactive ways of discovering stuff. I feel like social networks are great, but they're not geared up for educated discovery of resources in the way that this is. Now, will this answer all of your prayers in the first release? No because we'll get some things wrong. But that's why we need your feedback as a community to say, well, this is great, but I really changed that, and I would never use that. So that kind of feedback. But it's a good point. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Could this function as a community of practice? Absolutely. So um, I didn't want to just drop people straight into a random um, community. Because what happens is, you know when you signed up for a social network in like 2007, like I did with Twitter, or Facebook, or whatever it is, you were totally up for trying all different types of social networks. Now, you're like, well, I've got my, I've got my crew on different social networks, I'll try them out, but really, unless I get immediate traction, I'm not that interested. So I don't want to just drop people into like a Moodle social network. But that being said, because we're starting around a particular thing, which is the curation of resources, that can totally pivot into more meta conversations around well, what, what do we mean by the best resources? What do we mean by um, you know, different views of this particular subject or whatever it is? So the idea is that it will blossom into a much more general community practice network, et cetera. Um, 
Will this be a bolt-on for existing installations of Moodle in an institution, or would it require an entirely separate installation and therefore have separate infrastructure support needs? The latter. So this is completely separate to the Moodle learning platform, um, and it will have tight integration with Moodle, but even if you're using something different, you can still use MoodleNet. That's the idea. Yeah. And then finally, uh, i.e. as a distributed learning platform with user-generated content as opposed to just sharing already existing resources. Sorry, I don't... Is that... Was I... Con oh, was it continue on? It's been separated out, yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. So, to start off with, the, the quickest way to get resources in there is to reference stuff which already exists. So you saw on the thing, it was, it was YouTube, it was pulling stuff in from OER repositories, all that kind of stuff. But one of the things which um, is talked about in one of the screencasts is, well, okay, I've got something like a Moodle quiz and I want to share that. How do I share that? Because it hasn't got a public URL. So what we're going to do is to have like a Moodle repository which can then be referenced. So in the same way that we'll archive everything that currently exists on Moodle.net to be available as um, stuff which can be curated into the new Moodle.net, existing content in your Moodle course will then be, you'll be able to share that as a public URL in a collection. That's the, that's the idea. We very much want there to be lots of Moodle content there, obviously. Any final questions before I hand over to the next speaker? Um, can you hear me? Um, yes, where are you? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I had a question. Uh, you mentioned, oh, there you are. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, you mentioned you had a developer in Greece mm -hmm. and that we could access mm -hmm. um, the work that he's doing. Mm -hmm. Is that on a separate link or is that in the Moodle? Everything you need is on moodle.com forward slash moodle.net. If you click on tech choices, then you'll see um, lots of information about decentralization, federation. Um, we're also using uh, an not obscure but less well known. This is not going to be built in PHP. So um, the, some of the back-end stuff, we need high scalability and reliability. So we're building it in a language called Elixir. Um, and Mayor de Borniel, who's a technical architect, he has defended at length his decision as to why he's done that. And we're actually currently in the process of hiring an Elixir back-end developer from our office in Barcelona. Um, so he'll be coming on board in the next two weeks to start building that out. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.